Deep listening. الاستماع العميق. Deep listening. Intensive to hear. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. Look, one of the things for me was we've had a very uh, like a focus on my professional role, mm. and I think it's about distinguishing one's own professional role from just being themselves. So my family know that I'm a mediator and they sometimes remind me of that when I don't want to be reminded. But what I can definitely say is recognizing, um, without going into a lot of detail, that we've all got our own patterns of relating and particularly to particular family members. My father, who's now passed away, I can recognize, and it's, it's sad that it's after he's passed away, that I'm more mindful of the way in which I contributed to misunderstandings with my father and, to be honest, the way in which I didn't listen to him um, in crucial times or I listened to him from behind a bunker of my own creation so that when my father actually was really being quite open, I had so many defences around myself that I didn't really share myself and I didn't really listen to to my dad. So I was essentially uh, mind reading him and rather than actually really being truly present in the way that I can professionally. In this episode of Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words, we take a magical tour through modern corporate Australia with Ebor, a world-class mediator. He opens a window into modern corporations and looks at conflict and totally deconstructs it. He shows us What's disempowering about conflict avoidance? He shows us what's productive when conflict is managed well through a powerful and safe vessel. How many conflicts are you part of right now? And what role are you playing to avoid them? Listen carefully as Ebor provides some fantastic tips on how to make progress through conflict in a way that's supportive productive and impactful. Deep listening. Akshava amuka. L'écoute profonde. Deep listening. One of, one of the things I will explore, though, is um, attention I dance with. And the tension is that conflict is often avoided. And I'm curious with your perspective on what's productive in conflict because things of great power like gold are always conceived in conflict. In order for gold to emerge from that process, it also needs to be in a vessel. And so that vessel needs to be a space where we feel safe. And so the friction and the tension or the honesty that comes out of me telling somebody how it is, how I've been hurt or how I'm angry, in order for that to be received well, an environment needs to be created where it's actually safe for me to say that and it's even safe for the other person to hear that. So one of the challenges that I see as a mediator is creating an environment where it's actually okay to be disappointed, frustrated, let down and to communicate that and to communicate it as a human being who's having a human experience and who's not there to um, punish or hurt another person. So... That is easier said than done. I'd love you to explore a little more with this analogy of conflict and gold, Mm. but more importantly, the vessel. For those of us who are in the workplace and see conflict, how do you construct a vessel so it is safe? What are the elements and characteristics of a vessel that creates the safety to do that? Okay. Well, I think there are a number of ingredients Part of it is having a a baseline and uh, well, actually core values around the way we treat one another, being kind, being courteous, having a sense of humor, uh, being uh, thoughtful of others, being honest, and and recognizing that we're also human and we won't always deliver it. We, we get stressed. There can be misunderstandings. We can vent. We might speak to others about that rather than, than the person. So all of so there's a sense of acceptance that we're human, we're fallible, yet there's also a baseline that we need to commit to personally and start with that 
and we've got a responsibility. There needs to be a courage to check in with colleagues if we see something that we believe is inappropriate. There needs to be the the confidence and skill of managers to call behaviours when it's been um, brought to their attention or, when, or where they observe it. There needs to be an ability to develop compassion and understanding for one another. We are working with colleagues who potentially are struggling with personal issues, but we don't even know that. What we see is their behaviour, grumpy, uh, irritable, um, cold or aggressive or whatever, whatever it is. So having an understanding for one another, but still coming back to that baseline, I think there also needs to be an awareness of the social environment and that people do speak to each other and there is a way in which it's appropriate to, to vent without it turning, in, turning into gossip. So when you're listening to somebody, rather than fanning the flames and thinking in a conflict mindset, thinking about how can I help this person move on from this situation, learn their lesson and actually get out of this, um, this difficulty. So um, practicing giving feedback, practicing talking through, recognizing power dynamics. I left a job early in my career, one of the reasons was that the senior, most senior person um, had a very bad temper and once threw a file across the room when I was sitting and not, not far, not about a metre away from him, just in an absolute temper tantrum. And I didn't feel skilled enough to do anything about it other than leave the organisation. So there needs to be a maturity and that sort of thinking on a broader level to say, uh, well, look, you need to just go and talk to them and tell them how it is. Well, if this person's 30 years older than me, um, set up the and owns the organisation, and I'm just some young guy who just goes and does all of the crappy jobs, what's the likelihood that I'll actually have that conversation? Extremely low. Extremely low. So that needs to be understood as well, so that, that broader context. Mm. A number of managers are, are listeners in the audience and uh, they'd love to know Ebor's three tips for creating the safety vessel. What, what would you suggest three things managers can okay. either do or role model themselves? Okay, okay. So, so role modelling is the first part. So taking so when, when I'm wearing my role, when my, I, say, I say I'm wearing the hat as a manager. I'm still a human, yet I happen to have this hat on. And the interesting, and I'll say this in a, in a serious but also joking way, I'm sure in my job description, to the extent that I've ever read it, um, it says something about resolving conflict between staff. Now, if I was to scale myself on one to ten on my comfort or willingness to be able to address issues and I see them, and I can honestly say that I'm below a five, then just say, okay, that's something that I'm going to put on my list and I'm going to work on and actually take the opportunity to find a mentor, to find another colleague, a peer inside or outside of work, to practice that and to actually bring actual scenarios and, and work through it. So that's that's the first thing that I would um, encourage. The second one is to be aware of the factors that contribute to a, um, a positive work culture. And those things are around making people feel valued, recognized um, for the work that they do. Um, being aware of the social dynamics and that people have egos as well and that um, we need to be mindful that there will people will place value on different things. Um, and the reason I'm talking about the positive aspect is that what creates a vessel of security? Because you, I don't know, your, your listeners won't know that you introduced yourself to me prior to today to make me basically feel more comfortable. So there's things that I can do to create a safe environment or there's things that I could do to create an unsafe environment. So if I surprise people and there's no context to the reason why we're having a conversation, then it becomes unsafe and it's difficult. So I need to be mindful of creating that environment where people can be honest and where they can also um, be, um, they, where, where they can be human, um, but also take some responsibility for, for their behavior. The, the third thing is that I would um, encourage managers to also practice coaching their, um, their team members. When team members come to them with an issue, um, one of the things that managers often tell me is that they feel caught because they don't know what to do with the information. So the person's saying, well, this is going on, so-and-so is really annoying me, but I don't want to do anything about it. 
or I don't, I never want to work with them again, or you go and tell them to stop doing that thing. And the manager needs to be able to recognise that in the heat of the moment, that's how people feel. And then through a process of discussion, whether it's in that moment or shortly afterwards, you look at what is going to be done by the manager and also that individual. So it's not just um, taking the responsibility. So it's almost like people want to just pass the problem over. Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. I'm curious about the role of listening when you're mediating in situations. So can you bring our listeners in to a place and a space? What's a typical day look like for you okay. in preparing for something like that? What happens during that and what happens okay. after that? Look, the, it's quite fascinating because I, I, I have a number of windows into a situation. I mean, the first window is that I walk into an organisation where a manager or someone from HR has got a complex and messy problem on their table. So that's my window into an organisation. So rather than seeing their glossy flyers and their, and their fascinating website, I hear about people who are disgruntled, dismayed and absolutely at their wits end about whatever's going on. I speak to managers who feel frustrated with the participants or the, the, the people who are involved. Um, I, I also find it very interesting, the, the diversity um, of the managers in terms of the level of interest and involvement that they have. Mm -hmm and the level of interest that they take in their role in managing it. So another famous area of sort of outsourcing is, let's just call in a mediator and they'll sort this issue out because it's actually just two people who can't get along. Ignoring the fact that they work in a team, in an organisation, they happen to have some management structure and various values and work processes and, and so on. And so I find it very uh, rewarding and positive when I hear organisations, when I ask them questions about, for example, say, well, what has been done about this? And they're able to explain various steps that have been done. And sometimes I ask, well, what's been done about this? And they pretty much don't really have an answer and other than, oh, someone lodged a complaint and what was done about that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going through the grievance process. So it's almost like they're detached from the, their situation. And those ones, surprise, surprise, are the ones where what I find in conflict situations, it's very common for people to be aggrieved, not only with their work colleague, but at least um, one level of management um, in the process or with the HR um, um, professionals. Having said that, that's not always fair, but they their experience is that they have not been heard, that they have had their issues either sort of trivialised, um, that they've been made to be part of the problem, that mediation's sweeping things under the carpet. So part of my job is I ask probably about 15, 20 questions of the referrer and I sometimes even need to make sure that I even get to someone who can give me a um, an appropriately detailed context. So sometimes the briefing is delegated to someone who doesn't even know what's going on. So I don't accept that because that's actually a recipe for disaster. I'm walking into an absolute minefield. Um, so that's the first part. I also make contact with people. I speak to them on the phone or communicate via email to kick things off, I always need to ask to be introduced because people don't roll out the red carpet for the mediator. At least one person's not going to be very happy that I'm around. Without even having met me, um, I have to be prepared that people won't be too cheerful when they meet me. So I meet with people individually and that could be in our office. I might um, go to their office and they sometimes might have a support person, union or a family member, but most of the time they actually attend on their own. And uh, so that, that meeting is really about, one, explaining what it is that I do. I'm curious how you prepare yourself, because you've got to step into a mm. place where you suspend all judgment despite mm. whatever briefing you've had. So I'm picturing you coming into this room, all the excess furniture is mm. removed, there's yes. a window, it's in a private area, yes. and you have the parties or this, their um, um, support people with them. How do you step into that space? What do you do to prepare so that you're ready to listen completely and without judgment? I take a moment. Um, well, it depends on where, where I am and what I'm doing, but essentially, so whatever it is that I, where I, that I do this, 
I clear my mind and I set an intention. And the intention is for myself, which is to be present and to listen and to seek first to understand. That's the key things that I tell myself. Then I picture the individuals as as humans, as and I guess from a more spiritual perspective, just um, they are. I, I see them beyond just them as people and just their jobs. And well, I, I see them as I, I see their spirit. I see basically I visualize light, and I visualize that light shining very brightly. And I focus on that coming into the room and being able to serve to serve them. And I just basically say, you know, may the highest good um, be present here today. Something along those lines I'll say to myself. And so I, I really focus on just clearing my mind. And because I've learned time and time again that the more I think and plan, the more I'll be undone in either a positive or a negative way. So there's no point. Mm. When you're listening to the dialogue that emerges in front of you in that room, how conscious are you of noticing the breathing patterns of the counterparties in the dialogue as opposed okay. to the words coming out of their mouth? Look, it's, uh, it's, it is a very good, it is something that I notice. I'll use, th this is a very, this is an exceptional example, but it certainly did happen a lot in the family mediation work that I did, that there would be people who would have anxiety attacks or panic attacks and their breathing would be very, very, very rapid and I had to basically take a break. They would, <laughs> they would literally be like that. And that, that happened more individually where they were talking about what was going on. I've also noticed, and it's particularly men, and, and I've got very vivid physical memories of this. Well, one, I, I could see it, but I could also feel that they were holding their breath. And they were not just holding their breath, they were holding everything together. And I've seen some very big blokes, guys, absolutely explode in tears talking about their um, marriage breakup and not having seen their children. And they've just been hold, literally holding their breath and they sit in their chairs and I can notice as I give my little intro that they're barely even breathing. And the first word that they say is just to try to block any tears coming out. And then within a very short period of time, all of the tears and emotion and sobbing happens. Mm. So I notice that really holding... Uh, up up here. Um, other things that I notice, and I guess I can even be aware if I replay, is that when people start speaking very fast, and as opposed to when someone is pausing, relaxing, thinking things through, so, you, so I can definitely notice their, bre their breathing there. Noticing when people have a maybe a more high-pitched voice, I can pick that up and I'm really wanting to make the person feel more relaxed, slow things down. Do you notice a pattern of difference between how a woman may listen compared to how a man might listen? I'll say something that's quite fascinating. So in my workplace mediations, where there's a mediation involving two women and a mediation involving two men. So this, I'll, I'll start at the macro level. So a preliminary meeting could go for an hour to an hour and a half. With a man, it could, go, it could be over in half an hour. With a female participant, it could easily be for an hour and a half. Um, where there's two men in a joint mediation, it could comfortably be over in an hour and a half to, be, to less than that. Where there are two women in a mediation, it could take well over three hours. Um, so there's... So it's actually interesting now you've talked about listening so there's a there's a there's definitely more of a need to discuss feelings and the social context and the importance that well everybody wants to be heard and i think to on the flip side is that if you then speak more about the social content context and feelings a mediation takes longer um also, it's important, I notice, more so for women than for men, is the need to have their feelings validated in an explicit, verb spoken manner, summarised and recapped, whereas for men, there's less of an interest in that. It's more around, okay, we right now, 
you've said what you've needed to have, heard you. Can we move on now? Mm. So there's more of a that slightly more pragmatic mm. focus. I'm generalizing, but and what, what would be an example <laughs> of the, of the other one that you mentioned earlier on about explicit and validated? Okay, to be ex- explicit and validated is I can hear. So somebody may may say. I felt very uncomfortable working with you and yesterday or in, 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 the, in the meeting where you spoke over the top of me, I felt humiliated and you, could, you should have noticed that I was upset and um, you didn't come back and check with me. I feel so hurt and betrayed. And so a validation would be for the expecting or hoping that the other person would say something like, I didn't realise you were so upset in that meeting. I didn't mean to talk over the top of you. Uh, I noticed something about you. I thought you wanted to be alone. I really wish that I had reached out and checked in with you. I'm sorry that I didn't. I can see how that would have made a difference. But when there are men and women present, the way that emotion is processed is quite interesting um, because all, and so, and I've learned this by women telling me directly, and I can think of examples where women have, in as they tell me, have teared up and don't want to do that in front of, the the other person they feel it's very embarrassing or confronting and they tell me that they that if i you know i don't if i look like i might cry i want a break and i as a result i've actually learned to ask people let me like what would what would be a time because i can't read your mind how will i know when is a good time to take a break so that that's an example whereas for men it's not always obvious what is going on for them so I've also learned that because a guy looks cool and calm doesn't mean that he's not panicking underneath. So I'll take a break anyway. Um, that's what I've learned, particularly with men, because they tell me things like they haven't been sleeping or they've got an eczema and they'll show me even their eczema on their, under their shirt. Mm-hmm. So um, men and women can process their emotions quite differently. And I need to slow things down. I need to pause and allow... Um, um, for more so for men, for, so sometimes I might just repeat what uh, the, the female participant has said, and I'll check that the the, the male participant has has, has heard that. So I'll just pause. I've heard them say this. Did you hear that? Or what's your response to that? Or what? What did you notice when she said that she's really intimidated by you? I'm not agreeing that that's the way it is, but I've just heard her say that. And then just so pausing. So that's another thing that I might do. With the technique of pause, what are you seeking to achieve there? With pausing, I think it's about giving the respect and the space to what has been said. Because a lot can actually, we can jump over several topics, verbally and non-verbally, in a very short space of time. And there, you know, there can be a need to just address each one and give it its, give it its space, mm. basically. So it, it's basically allowing each area to be, to be addressed. Mm. We live in a country of many nationalities and cultures. I'm intrigued to explore the difference between people with English as a first language in a mediation and those where it's not. Okay. I have had mediations where people apologize to me for not speaking um, English well or to a level that they, that they would like to. Um, or they apologize for their accent. So the first thing that I would say is that there are people who are aware and self-conscious of their accent or their level of English, and they tell me so, and even apologize for that. And I always reassure them, and I just say, look, I said each of my parents weren't born in Australia, and I've also got a a stepfather for another country. I said, so many different accents around that I've just had to, and I've grown up in the Sutherland Shire with a super Aussie accent and whatnot. So to speak comfortably and don't worry it's all it's all fine just try to reassure people it is quite interesting because there are nuances to language that are lost and so because i mean what i'll say is that i meet with people individually and i i wish so many times that the other person could be a fly on the wall and hear 
some, but not all, of what's being said. They don't want to hear some of the other, some of the things that are saying. But some of the things where they can actually see that this is a fallible person who's struggling with something. And that they could, and part of that can also include their embarrassment around language and around their style. And you can actually get that the person's trying to say something and they're struggling with, with getting a message across. And when th there's someone else present, it's easy, I, I, I'm guessing, that the person would just shut down and they might just not, they might not say it. Mm -hmm. But because I'm, they don't know me and I'm, we're having a one-on-one -on -one catch up, they can sort of fumble around a little bit in order to lay, till they get that, what they really want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not so easy to do that when there's someone else who you've got a disagreement with. Mm -hmm. I, I once had a mediation, which was very interesting, um, where there was a, it was a male, actually, well, he was um, of a, a Korean background and an Australian Anglo-Saxon background and the um, the male told me that culturally he could not disagree with his manager and he had never just shared that with his manager so he wouldn't tell his manager what he disagreed with and he told me it would be of the utmost disrespect to do that Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. So I was just I talked to him about what the practical effects that 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 would be, and we just sort of you know just explored that. So that was just like it's a very practical example mm -hmm. of a cultural. That's just that 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 wasn't just language, but that was a, a cultural mm -hmm. assumption mm -hmm. around what was appropriate or not to say mm -hmm. to your manager. Mm -hmm. Very hierarchical. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. When you notice managers who are leading systemically, how do they listen mm. differently to others? They listen to what's important. So there is what the person is saying. And so I won't always tell you what is important. I want you to guess that what I'm telling you is important. So for example, um, one of the an example of of something that people have told me they find very hurtful is where their manager takes credit for their work publicly in front in front of others. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know, but that's their perception. My manager's taken the credit or someone else has taken the credit for my work. Now, um, what we need to think about is what... So rather than focusing on did I or did I not take the credit for this person's work and just think systemically, what do I know? People want to feel valued and that their contribution makes a, different, a, a difference to the workplace and that they have a passion for what they do. So when someone has a passion for what they do and they, they want recognition, then if they feel that, they, that that's been taken away from them, that's going to be important, okay? Mm. So, my, so, so, so to think systemically, I need to go beyond, did I or did I not take credit and think, um, how does this person, so what is this person passionate about? How do they seek, what's important to them? What makes them feel validated? What makes them feel connected? What makes them want to come in on a Monday and really enjoy having finished a really good week? So if I think about that on a broader level, then it's possible for me to then have a, um, a deeper understanding of why something like that. Because if I just look at one example, because I always see that um, when there's a misunderstanding, it's often just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm telling you about something because it just came up and that's, but there's probably a series of things that have happened where this person has felt sidelined, marginalized, overlooked. They didn't get the training that they applied for they didn't appreciate how a particular project was given to another person or whatever the case may be. And then it's now safe because I can prove to you that in that email and you copied everyone in and you said that you claimed it so I can show you. But in fact, on a broader level, it's about my place in the team. Mm. So anyway, it's a long answer. <laughs> yeah, no, but what, what you highlight there is uh, great systemic listeners uh, listening deliberately for what's unsaid. They're listening mm. beyond the obvious um, there. So uh, a, a terrific example. 
I'm far from a great listener. Every day is another day where I'm challenging myself to get better. You need to listen over focused periods of time. Have you ever noticed yourself drifting out of the conversation and not mm. completely there with the intention you set up? And how do you get yourself mm. back into the dialogue? Can you think of some yeah, examples look, yeah, of look, that happening? Look, yeah, look, one of the examples, and it is tricky, and that's to do with time. And I'm not the first person to say this. Um, so when I've spoken to counsellors or other mediators, it's not unusual that somebody tells you the most crucial piece of information with just a few minutes to go. So you've been talking about a lot of things. It's sort of been quite sort of, in a sense, let's just say routine or bland. Mm. Then all of a sudden, they tell you this big clangor. Look, I'm not planning to stay in this job. Um, I'm actively seeking other work. And we're actually meeting the following day and we're talking about sort of tangible project issues and working on working things out and planning you know, how to make this team effective. And this person's already checked out, so they've got very limited investment. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's quite crucial. Or somebody tells me about an incident, um, and this happened recently, where they talked about a lot of things about the discomfort with their work relationship and in the last few minutes, they told me about a situation where, well, they alleged that their manager um, said to them something along the lines of, yes, I'm a bully, and then, uh, and I don't really care, just get used to it, just do your job. And, just, and, and then they told me, I haven't told anybody, because this mediation um, has already started, I didn't want to make things worse, but I'm really not comfortable with, with what they said to me. And I've got to think about, can I, well, I haven't actually met the other person yet and this person's, and I've got to talk to them about the significance of the event, how comfortable they will be, do they wish to raise it in the meeting, that they've mentioned a lot of things already to me, but this really sounds some, quite serious. So they're, they're telling me something that's been quite impactful. Mm -hmm. I had another person who's told me and disclosed to me that they had, have been the victim of um, domestic violence for many years and... Um, that their confrontation with their colleague um, made them have, have flashbacks about being chased down a corridor at home by their ex-partner when, when their colleague, in inverted commas, chased them down the corridor to, you know, to sort out an issue and they went into a panic. Um, so they tell me this right at the very end and start crying. So these are things that happen right at the end when we're finishing, and I've sometimes got an appointment shortly afterwards, and it's it's quite challenging because I've got a sort of a mental clock happening. I'm thinking, okay, wow, I better stay focused on what's happening here. We're going to run a bit late. Mm. I need to think about how to appropriately. That's that's probably the most. That's the tricky one where I'm thinking about appropriately and respectfully um, closing off a discussion. Deep listening. Écoute attentive. Bene ascoltare. Ukulalela fieleja. Ironically, we're drawing to the end yes. of our time. And what is it that you think we haven't discussed that's important for people to understand about listening deeply in times where there is conflict? Look, one of the things for me was we've had a very uh, like a focus on my professional role, mm. and I think it's about distinguishing one's own professional role from just being themselves. So my family know that I'm a mediator, and they sometimes remind me of that when I don't want to be reminded. But what I can definitely say is recognising, um, without going into a lot of detail, that we've all got our own patterns of relating, and particularly to particular family members. My father, who's now passed away, I can recognise and it's, it's sad that it's after he's passed away that I'm more mindful of the way in which I contributed to misunderstandings with my father and, to be honest, the way in which I didn't listen to him um, in crucial times or I listened to him from behind a bunker of my own creation so that when my father actually was really being quite open, I had so many defences around myself that I didn't really share myself and I didn't really listen to to my dad. So I was essentially uh, mind reading him 
and rather than actually really being truly present in a way that I can professionally. So that's, that's my biggest lesson is to apply the things that I can do professionally within my own um, close relationships because that's definitely very different. It's, it's a lot easier to be a mediator than one might imagine, although there are certain skills and things that you do definitely learn, but that's something for sure that I think is crucial. Um, the other part is also the willingness to put oneself um, forward. So, so when, when I have... So, what, let me just say that again. The willingness to put, to be vulnerable as a listener. So um, I have worked with other mediators in family mediation where I've seen them have tears in their eyes when very emotional things are being discussed. And I've questioned myself. I thought, gee, is that appropriate? Mediators, are they allowed to cry or show emotion? And, I, and I've learned that it's actually okay at the right time. And I've noticed my own voice break with emotion in particular situations. And it's because there's been such a level of sadness and distress being expressed that I allowed myself to... So to truly listen, um, I need to take the risk to go into that space in an appropriate way myself. And there's, there's a whole lot of literature around how you need to do that and, and the risks associated with it. But one of the things is to at least allow yourself to put your toes in that emotional water. And the risk is that I will also feel pain and sadness and that it will be evident through my body language, through my voice, and that will be visible to the other people. They will notice that the other person has been touched by what they've said. And that's a very powerful lesson that I've learned from my um, mentor mediators, that it's actually totally fine to do that. And it's actually really respectful of the other person. Mm. So that's, that's a, it, it's, it's a tricky one in a work context, but it can be done. I'd like to explore the vulnerability real time. I'd like you to share if you're comfortable with the audience where that place and space was with your dad that you mm. didn't listen and you created barriers because I think it's a wonderful learning mm. opportunity for them. Well, look, my dad um, was Peruvian and my first trip to Peru was with my father about 12 years ago. We went to Machu Picchu and we did the uh, shorter walk. So we did an overnight walk, got to Machu Picchu. If anyone's seen the iconic pictures of Machu Picchu, it can't be taken from Machu Picchu because you're standing on it. So you've got to be on the neighboring mountain, which is called Huayna Picchu. And so my dad and I climbed Huayna Picchu and it was closed on that day. It was very foggy. It was rainy. It was very dangerous. Anyway, um, we got to this spot where to take the iconic photo. My dad was an, an absolute enthusiast of photo taking, which is a bit laborious for people who don't like taking so many photos. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so my dad actually took this photo um, of me um, with much pitch in the background. We took photos of one another. And unfortunately, very sadly, my dad, very shortly after just taking the photo, he actually fell down these very steep steps and he could have held on to a, a chain um, that was on the, on the cliff face, but he protected his camera instead. Anyway, he fell, and uh, we, we found out after, but he cracked a few ribs and strained ligaments in his knees, and he was winded very badly. And um, my dad, um, well, I jumped down. I was very distressed. I sort of ripped his shirt open. I thought he'd cracked, I don't know, like he was, I thought, well, I thought he punctured a lung, actually. I didn't know what was, I was panicking. Anyway, um, after several minutes, he was able to stabilize and um, we very, very, very slowly got back down and uh, my dad gradually got his energy back. And on the train going back to Cusco, um, my dad said to me, he said, you've always been so good to me. Thank you so much. You've really saved me there. And he started crying and he put his head on my shoulder and fell asleep. And I, could, I had a wet shoulder, and then my dad's there, and it was very, it was, it was so unexpected, because I've never seen my dad 
like that. And then, but then he was sleeping. And so it's like the moment just was there and then it went away. And my one of my uncles is a doctor and we went to hospital, took my dad to a hospital where he got x-rays and whatnot. And my dad was sitting in the hospital bed after he had his examination. And he was just, he sat up and he looked at me and he said, so he will tell me a little bit about yourself. What's going on for you? And it was such a lovely question. And this is coming after my dad, having said earlier in the day and having cried and fallen asleep on my shoulder. And I sat there, we were alone in the hospital and I sat there and I, part of me wanted to speak to my dad and the other part gave, didn't, wasn't ready and I just gave him quite, I don't even know what I said, but it wasn't, it's quite a sort of a robotic everyday sort of response and I didn't, I wasn't able to connect to that sensitive part or that sort of softer part of myself to connect with that softer part with my dad uh, and, I, and I realized that afterwards that I was really so accustomed, I mean, we were speaking in Spanish, I have to say, uh, as well. So there's a slightly different dynamic there. But for my dad, who was extremely verbose, all his siblings will say this, that's not just my opinion, for him just to ask me an open question and then be silent was so unexpected that I couldn't sadly share myself in that space. I just didn't really say much. I really regret that. I really wish I could I could go back to that and just say to my dad, I was so, so worried about you today. So glad you're alive. So, so happy. Couldn't believe it. I literally felt that your life was in my hands. But I didn't say that. I said, I'm so glad you're alive. You cried today. I've never seen you cry before. I've always seen you as being so serious and strong, and you just cried. And you slept on my shoulder all the way back on the four-hour train ride. I can still feel your tears on my shoulder. I never said that to my dad, and I wish I did. I regret that. Well, you have, and he's heard you. Mm. Well done. showing great vulnerability in sharing that story and I really appreciate it. So the irony is not lost that the most mm. powerful story comes out at the end. Mm, yes. <laughs> How comfortable would you be in saying in Spanish the words your father said to you? Okay. Let me just Take your time. Mi papá me dijo algo como, cuéntame algo de tu vida. Quiero escuchar un poco de ti. I heard something slightly different in Spanish. There's a much greater intimacy in what you said mm -hmm. the second time. And there's a bigger connection mm -hmm. and a great example of the power of language. What was unexpected for you today? Uh, this uh, the the question about vulnerability. I mean, I I think that was a good one to pick up on mm. because that's um, absolutely appropriate to at least allow the space for that. Mm. Given that I touched on it, then you also put your toe in the water, and then I could put another foot in the water as well if I wanted to. Ebo, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Pleasure. That's good. Deep listening. Deep listening. Who yingi se la shinene? Who kai kikitori? Deep listening. Could you picture yourself in some of those meetings with some of those people who were angry, who were frustrated, who were holding back? And equally, could you find yourself in those meetings? 
where you were honest and vulnerable enough to say you didn't know the answer. When Ebor told that story about his father and the impact that him not listening to his dad, when he asked probably one of the most important questions of his lifetime, what was going through your mind? I think Ebor role modelled spectacularly well what it takes to be a world-class listener. He's someone who listens with his eyes as well as his ears. He's conscious of the language that everybody uses. But most importantly, he looks to see the light inside everybody to create a positive and powerful outcome. I love the way he prepares for every meeting with an intention. I love how focused he is on listening to himself before he gets into the conflict situation. The way he talked about breathing, the way he thought about creating the right intention for a meeting are powerful lessons for all of us, but especially for me. What I took away from his conversation today was listening requires some level of sharing, some level of vulnerability to allow the other person to know that you're sharing a connection in that moment when you're listening deeply. Deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Deep listening. Deep listening. Whakarongo Pohonu. Deep listening. Impact beyond words.